Hey everybody, uh, one of the mechanisms that we talked about quite a bit um, is the ribonuclease A mechanism. Um, we talked about a grand total of four different mechanisms, but we spent a good bit of time on this, and I'm going to go through all of the different mechanisms that we discussed, but I wanted to start out with this one because it's kind of the simplest, um, and maybe it's the most direct. Um, so my natural segue to discussing this is putting this in context. Um, whenever you are looking at any sort of enzymatic mechanism, it's going to fall into one of three different categories. Excuse me, those categories are acid-base catalysis, metal ion catalysis, or um, covalent catalysis. And so when we start talking about acid-base catalysis, um, basically our definition is acid-base catalysis is involved in all enzymatic reactions involving proton transfer. Okay, pretty straightforward there. General acid catalysis, a general acid donates a proton to a substrate, an enzyme active site residue must be protonated. So it has to have that proton in order to give it up. And so when you see this sort of definition, what I want you to be doing is I want you to be thinking about, okay, what residues are good candidates to be involved in general acid catalysis? So would a aspartic acid residue at a physiological pH be a good candidate? Well, think about that R group and think about that pKa of that R group. Aspartic acid, glutamic acid, they're both going to have a pKa of around 3.7, or below, they're both going to be around, uh, below, I'm sorry, below 3.7. And so at a physiological pH, are those residues going to be protonated? They're not. So do they have the proton that they can transfer? No, they don't. So then what you should be thinking is, what are good candidates? Well, some really good candidates would be something like an arginine or a lysine, because those both have pKa values that are fairly high. Histidine might also be good, um, because histidine's pKa is about six, and at a physiological pH, it's entirely possible that it will be protonated. So when we continue on from there, we have our definition for a general base. So general base catalysis is one in which a base accepts a proton from the substrate. So an enzyme active site must be deprotonated. So just as good general acids were arginine and lysine and maybe histidine, a good base would be something like, well, aspartic or glutamic acid. Likewise, histidine could be good because it, it would be a deprotonated um, residue there. Now, with that said, we have a concerted acid-base catalysis. So that's a general acid and a general base both participate in the reaction. So we're going to use that as so we're going to use that those definitions to look at the RNA A mechanism or the ribonuclease A mechanism. Now, one of the things that is is I don't know if it's necessarily it's a little bit challenging, but whenever you look at a mechanism, you have to figure out what you're looking at first and foremost. So this semicircle right here, this brown semicircle that I just drew two little squiggles around in green, that is basically your polypeptide backbone. That's showing the active site. There's some three-dimensional conformation of this protein that enables or that folds so that these two amino acid residues, histidine 12 and histidine 119, are basically this far from one another. And when those are present, what we can have is our substrate, this RNA molecule, which is all right here. That RNA molecule can enter that active site and be cleaved. So that's our first cell. Our next cell, let's look at the transition to that. What do we have? Well, in this line right here for one, what this is showing is that water is going to be coming in. And so if water is entering the active site and involved in some of the chemistry, what type of enzyme do you think this would be? Well, good idea is to think it's involving water. There's probably a hydrolysis. This would be a hydrolase. Now, what we have with that said is what's the second part here? The second part is basically this is our RNA molecule that has been cleaved and released. Now, what that shows you is that in this first step, your RNA molecule has already been cut. But are you done with the reaction? No, you're not, because you haven't returned your enzyme to its original state. So let's look back at part one, or this first cell here, and I want you to draw particular attention to or, or really appreciate the states of these two histidines, histidine 12 and histidine 119. Histidine 12, we've got our 
pyrimidine ring and we've got a nitrogen with a lone pair of electrons. So is that residue, is that protonated? No, it's not. So that is a deprotonated residue. So is that serving as an acid or a base? That's going to be serving as a base. So we have histidine 12, his, yeah, histidine 12. I'm just going to write B indicating a base. Histidine 119. Well, we've got both of our nitrogen atoms in our pyrimidine ring. They both have hydrogens. And any time that you see a nitrogen or two nitrogens in a histidine ring with hydrogens, one of them is going to be positively charged. And so that means our residue is protonated. So we have histidine 119 that is protonated. And so it is eligible to no donate that proton. That would be serving as our acid. Okay, now if you look at the movement of these electrons, histidine 119 serving as our base is going to pick off this hydrogen from our hydroxide group on carbon two prime. Okay, whenever it picks the, that proton off, the electrons that are within the bond from oxygen to hydrogen, they are going to move down to form a bond with our phosphate group, okay? The electrons that are between our phosphorus and our oxygen making up basically the second half of our phosphodiester bond, those electrons are going to come down here and pick up a proton. And whenever that happens, you form an OH group on carbon five prime, which is one of the carbons on our uh, RNA molecule. So that is going to, this action right here is going to release our substrate. It's going to release our product, or one of our products, I'm sorry. What happens in the second phase right here, so I just drew a little squiggly line around there, is we have a cyclic nucleotide. We have a two prime to three prime cyclic nucleotide. We also have a protonated histidine 12 and a deprotonated histidine 119. Water comes in and is going to be involved in regenerating our enzyme. So we have the water molecule that will serve as an acid because it is going to donate a proton to histidine number 119. Now, whenever that histidine 119 picks up that proton, now we have the remaining OH that goes to our phosphorus. So that will give us an OH group on our phosphorus, enabling the electrons that are between our phosphorus and one of our oxygens on carbon two prime of our sugar to go and pick up that proton on histidine number 12, which would leave our histidine 12 as deprotonated. So ultimately, if you look in this last phase of this image, right, or this last sequence right here, you'll see that histidine 12 has been deprotonated, histidine 119 is protonated, and we have a phosphate group that has a single OH group on it. So through all of this, we've started, we've started with a molecule that had a deprotonated histidine, a protonated histidine, and we end with a histidine that is deprotonated and then a histidine that is protonated. So after it's all said and done, that's basically the rundown of our RNA-say mechanism. All right, well.